Inner World Odyssey. Today we're talking with music legend, the Mega Rhino. And we're going to play a little bit of one of his songs from his, one of his newest albums here on the podcast called We Gon' Stomp Shit. We gon' stomp shit! Let's go! The Mighty Rhino! All I gotta do is say my fucking name on a drawing and baby a song. I'm a Baha'i baby, but I'm wild as James B. Ow. You can call me Slick Rick James Bond. This is Sewer 67, I have four alarm plays. Y'all amazed I could probably create the Quran. I would be finished, you out the motherfucking window. I'm Delroy Lindo. The Mighty Rhino. Welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you. Thank you, Doctor. I'm very honored to be here. It means a lot. Yeah, so I was always curious about where this passion of yours comes from. It really comes through in your music, and you kind of explode with passion on your songs. That's very kind of you. I, um, well, I mean, you refer to me as a music legend, and I don't think very many people know who I am, and I think even those who know who I am would dispute that uh, distinction, but I'm still very honored that you would see fit to say something like that. Um I've been involved with rap music since I was 12 years old in the year 2000. Uh, my elder sister, who's older than me by nine months, and my elder brother, who's older than me by 11 years, both introduced me to different uh, subgenres and styles of hip hop around that time. And uh, I gained a passion for all of it and have sort of been steadily honing and working on my craft ever since then because, uh, particularly, Particularly um, after I heard a rapper from both Chicago and L.A. called Charlie Tuna, who was a member of a group called Jurassic Five. He was the rapper who inspired me to think, OK, well, not only do I love this stuff and not only is this my new favorite thing, but I would like to learn to do this myself to enough of a standard of competency that the music I make will be good. And so uh, he was my first teacher, I guess, in that sense. And there were very, very many others back in those days who inspired me for various reasons. And uh, CL Smooth of the group, Pete Rock and CL Smooth, Dreads of Black Sheep, the Japanese American Jewish rapper Lyrics Born. There were many, many others in those days, Sun Dubia, Funk Dubious, the Goats, who were a First Nations group from Philadelphia. There were very many who inspired me. And I um, delved deeper and deeper into the subculture and uh, to different facets and subgenres and whatnot. And uh, I've been very blessed because admittedly, of course, I at least conditionally, I'm a white person and white people are always guests in hip hop and rap music, but uh, I've been able to make a quantity of music that I think is at least somewhat good, good enough that I belong here, good enough that I'm not just an unwanted guest, that I'm not just an embarrassment to the culture, but that the quality of my music is actually good enough that I belong here and I'm able to make contributions that seem worthy and that uh, matter to the people who hear them. So that's a great honor for me. And um, the passion, I guess, comes from the fact that uh, there have been so many incredible entertainers in the history of rap music, uh, outsized personalities, Redman, Buster Rhymes, Gunplay, uh charlie tuna again dub c of west side connection uh sugar free e40 a lot of these uh, young bleed a lot of these inspiring uh figures who uh sort of broke through and and uh glowed with dynamism and integrity and energy and so these are some of the figures some of the very many and i could list them all night so very many figures in rap music who made me want to uh represent myself with an energy that was a reflection of their energy and with an integrity that was a reflection of their integrity and a creativity and honesty and intelligence and uh, warmth and humor and so forth that made it possible for me to stand with the greats from whom I'd learned everything I know about how to make rap music. Wow. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed your music personally. I find it it's catchy. It has a lot of soul and meaning to it and just well produced and the people you collaborate with seem to be very competent in terms of the rhymes and the flow that they have and it's very cool to see something like these projects you create come together with talented artists where we live in a world where there's a lot of uh 
like wannabes, a lot of artists that are trying to put things out just for the sake of being out there. And to see something with substance is always encouraging. And I like hearing your stuff. And I always tell people, like, you got to hear this because it's something that really pops. It has something to it. That means the world, man. Thank you so much. I'm honored. You know, I, I've always been striving to make sure that my music has character and that my music has um, a sense of verve and vitality to it. And that um, sometimes I'll be rapping about, you know, very emotive things and very sort of trying to tread like very sensitive and emotive and introspective territory. And I try to do that with integrity. But then also when I get to explode with, you know, verve and passion and like, I'm a better rapper than you, motherfucker, like that kind of thing. Like with the wordplay and pizzazz and, and, and funk and style, you know, I want to do that too. I want to like, I want to throw down and show them other, so the people what the mighty motherfucking rhino is made of, you know what I'm talking about? Like it's always, it's never been either or, it's always been both hand and it's always been about like, if I'm going to write a song about my feelings and about how I'm feeling about a given issue, whether it's political or spiritual or uh, something to do with an experience, a family or friends, then I'm going to want to represent that honestly and put it together in an, in a well-rhymed and, and, and intelligent and thoughtful package. But on the other hand, if I'm just exploding with energy on a mic and throwing down and showing motherfuckers what I can do with lyrics and words and forms and that sort of thing, like I love doing that and I ne that never gets old to me, like finding new ways to be witty and to use words that are not commonly used in rap music, introduce ideas that have never been mentioned before in rap music, whether political or spiritual or what have you. You know, I want to do that. And I also like to pay homage to the, the heroes that I grew up on, you know. So sometimes, you know, little bits of the flow or style or energy or uh, savoir faire of some of these uh, legends I grew up on will make their way into the music, which is why you can hear certain songs and you can hear a flow on one of my songs. And it's like, oh, that sounds just like Petey Crack. And it's not because I'm trying to bite Petey Crack or or uh, pat pattern my music exactly and, you know, unchangeably after him, but I'd so, sort of flow, throw his flow in there as one of my the many tools in the arsenal. And same thing with Joker Free, the same thing with uh, Charlie Tuna and Lyric Born, and the same thing with uh, very, very many others of various... Uh, Scarface certainly is one of my, my favorites and one of those who's inspired me the most. Ghostface Kill is probably my very personal favorite and has has inspired me a lot in very many different ways and i don't generally disguise that these people have an influence on my music i usually will like broadcast it pretty openly but what i'm trying to do with it is flip it in creative enough ways so that it doesn't come across as what in hip-hop culture we call biting which is taking unproductively from someone's style and passing it off as your own that's very much not what i'm trying to do it's very much something i'm finna like very, very much something that I'm trying to uh, avoid and and work against. What I want to do instead is like tip the hat to these rappers who've inspired me, of whom there are well over a hundred. And you know, I wouldn't mind if they were able to see seeds of of what they do in my music. But by the same token, I want to represent myself with style and originality and authenticity. And you know. By the grace of God, I think I've managed to do it at least some of the time, you know, shit. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you say that. You're paying homage to the legends and those who you aspire to and who you appreciate. And that's really beautiful thing. Yeah. Have. I appreciate that very much, Harrison. And I've, I've been lucky because I think there's been a total of, let's say, 21, 22 uh, rappers who I grew up on, who've worked with me at various times on music and a handful of others from whom, for whom I've had the opportunity to open. And uh, sometimes I've made really great bangers with these people. Like I made a joint with Young Bleed from Louisiana, who's a rapper I've cherished for upwards of 10 years. And we made a joint called Tell Me This Shit Ain't Some Fire. And it's a fucking heat rock from my most recent album, which to we gonna stomp shit's also from which is called uh, truly the soul laden heart that's my most recent solo album i should say that came out on spotify in january of 2024 and it was already on a band camp in 2022 so uh i'm very proud of that record and that's got ag of 
the digging in the crates crew. It's got Slaughter Rico from Philadelphia, Tragedy Gaddafi from Queensridge, the legendary Juice crew. It's got uh, Guilty Simpson from Detroit, who I'm working with on some new music as well. It's got uh, Thurston Howell the Third, the legendary Polo Rican from the Bron- uh, from uh, Brooklyn, and uh, it's got uh, Bonshaw, my favorite rapper from the Canadian Maritimes. It's got Shad, the legendary Juno winning. Uh, Robert from London, Ontario, who's originally Kenyan and Rwa- Kenyan and Rwandan, and uh, also recently, uh, this past third of May, and that's the month we're currently in now, May twenty twenty four. I uh, released now with my my boy Skizza from Saskatoon, wonderful guy, very talented rapper, and we threw down and crafted. It took it took us about five years, but we crafted an album that. Uh, that we think is dope as hell, and that's called Northern Flavoristic Metro Pass Music, patterned after the title of the first Outcast album from 1994, 30 years ago, Southern Flavoristic Cadillac Music. And we got on that record, we got Palin and Yonzi of The Outsiders from New Jersey, Elder Sensei of The Artifacts, also from New Jersey, Big Mike from Texas and uh, Louisiana, from the rap crew, and uh, he was a former member of the Ghetto Boys and was Snoop Dogg's roommate for a while. And uh, we got, uh, there's someone else I'm trying to remember, uh, decisive, the legendary Canadian rapper and uh, sort of leading light of the Canadian rap avant garde, you know. So we've, we've and I've worked with Adam Bomb, Prince Poe, Mike and I, Fat Lip, uh, lots of other illustrious, Witch Doctor of the Dungeon Family, lots of other illustrious luminaries. And I've, I've been delighted by that. And I've, I've even, even Ritz, who is a much more famous artist than probably any other artist i've worked with he's a white dude with a big red beard who got start with yellow wolf in the 2010s and um he's become uh an underground rap institution he's a very talented cat and i was able to nab a guest verse from him on my very first album which came out of the tail end of 2011 and spread around in 2012 so i've had a good run and i've been, been able to really enjoy and have a good time with um with some of these remarkable artists I've had the good fortune to work with as featured guests. It's been lots of fun. And I don't generally spend too much money on it. There's been a couple cases where friends of mine or family members have bought me uh, expensive featured guest appearances as, as gifts. But generally speaking, it's money that I painstakingly raise, whether through GoFundMe or just squirreling away and saving the money I get as a the disabled person from Ontario Disability Support, because of course I live in Toronto, as I believe you do, and uh, I'm on ODSP. So most of the money that I get for these ventures comes from Ontario Disability Support. Um, I'm looking forward to doing something with Nature of the Firm if I'm get if I got really lucky because I'm in talks with him right now. And so, you know, it's not a flashy enterprise. That's, that's what I'm trying to underline is that. It's delightful and meaningful and, and and enjoyable for me to be able to work with these legends I grew up on. And it's meaningful because uh, that's part of why I do it is so that I can hang with the greats. But it's not a very flashy enterprise. It's one relatively poor and mixed up uh, disabled person and mentally ill person from Toronto scraping together what little I can to, and then some of the greats will say yes and rock with me and some won't it just is what it is wow well impressive for what you're working with that's really like the production quality is very high and the the songs are just speak for themselves i really enjoyed that album as well it has a nice funk to it and i recognize the the homage to uh outcast in one of the songs and that's a, a rapper I also enjoy. Like I'm a, I'm a fan of rap. I don't know quite as much as you about all the rappers, but I definitely appreciate sure. Outcast is two people, Andre 3000 and Big Boy. Oh, okay, yeah. I know the the band and yeah, they're he's very good at at rapping and like very fast rapper, very clever fun type of things. And yeah. So, um, when do you think you knew like who you are? You have the the name, the Mighty Rhino, and when when did you feel it in your life that you become that person? Well, uh, 
the way my state, I don't know whether you're asking this question exactly, but this is the question I'm going to answer because it's difficult for me to figure out how else to frame this. Um, the stage name, the Mighty Rhino, originated because the word rhinoceros was just the weirdest word that I could think of that I knew everyone else around me would still be able to pronounce and spell. So that's what I went with when I first needed a stage name, which was not originally when I started rapping, but when I was performing hip hop karaoke, which was an institution in Toronto for 10 years from 2007 to 2017. I wasn't there for the whole period, but I was there for much of it. And I became one of the more popular performers at that event. And I originally called myself Rhinoceros then. And then I saw in one of the weekly papers, I saw that the Calypso artist, the Mighty Sparrow, was doing a uh, was doing a uh, concert in Toronto, and I thought that would be perfect. And so I turned myself into the Mighty Rhino. And sometimes I wonder whether I shouldn't have just na named myself after an elephant instead, because uh, I love elephants even more than I love rhinoceros rhinoceroses, but I love them both. And uh, and um, it's just. Uh, it's just, uh, I mean, when did I become the Mighty Rhino? I mean, I knew when I wanted to start rapping that I wanted to do so with an explosive panache. And uh, with a lot of, forgive me, I'm being distracted as we hoped I wouldn't be. Um, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a lot of joy and uh, a lot of verve and pizzazz and, and, and positive energy. And so when I was first performing other people's tracks as a hip hop karaoke performer, you go up and you memorize something. There's no bouncy ball or anything. You go up and you memorize a song and you perform it with the gusto and the, and the enthusiasm and the showmanship as if it was yours. And that's what I did with songs by Most Def and Nas and OP and, and uh, Falk Dubious and AZ and various others. And uh, Nas, certainly, uh, Outcast, UGK. And so uh, it was lots of fun. And I must have performed maybe 50 or 60 different tracks over the course of about 10 years. And uh, I became known in the city and in the community of people who care about this kind of thing all over the world for performances so packed with energy that people would take special trips to town just to see what I would do or they would react with a particular awe and joy and ecstasy to see me throw down. And I wasn't, by any stretch of the imagination, the only performer that good. There were several of us, probably more than 10 of us, who really threw down in those years and in those days. And uh, shout out to Mr. Mischief and the Egyptian Prescription and Spartacus and Sherry P and Maravi and Splatter Monkey and Wicked Queen, you know, there were a lot of motherfuckers like Jack Moves, my man Jack Moves, shout out to the big homie, you know, talk about. Like, there were a lot of people, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of important people. Chef Mo, you know, um, Natty Mac, a lot. These these were just the 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 stage monikers. Measuring Man, of course, the great. Um, the, the stage monikers of a lot of people who threw down and really performed amazing like we would put on amazing performances at hip hop karaoke and we would all memorize virtually none of us would use the lyrics that would be printed out and available for us to read. Uh, and in particular, there's a couple uh, there's a couple uh, performances that are still on YouTube. There's 19 year old me doing halftime by Nas. There's the next month. Still, I'm still 19 and I did an Annie up by MOP and it really uh, tore the roof off the joint and the, the month after that, I did Mathematics by the former Most Deaf. And that was, I think, my best performance ever. And there's been many others over the years. And many, many other performers who were equally as good as I was really just throwing down and just putting on clinics. My man p -Laf is another, you know, uh, nameless when he would sh show up and throw down. He was always amazing. You know, there's a handful. There were maybe like 20 of us and... There were even some I didn't get to know because I, I would stop coming after a few years and and there was a whole new crop who 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 won the hearts of, of 
hip hop karaoke showgoers, and um, it ran from 2007 to 2017. And that was where I cut my teeth as a performer for doing most of my uh, original rapping. I, I had written raps starting in like 2002 when I was 14, of course, but but I didn't record much of anything until 2008, 2009, and then ultimately uh, Hip Hop Karaoke had two hosts, Abdominal and More or Less, and More or Less was my man, and uh, shout out to the big old me, Uncle Les, Grand Verbalizer, what time is it? Grand Verbalizer, Funk, Grand, Grand Verbalizer, More or Less, Brother Great, one of the great motherfuckers in this world, one of the most beautifulest and most gloriousest, gloriousest and gorgeousest motherfuckers that I love so dear. Um, I'm just deliberately going over the top with affection for more or less because I know it makes him laugh and roll his eyes. Uh, but anyway, uh, more or less was my guy and more or less invited me onto one of his albums, an album from 2010 called Brunch with a Vengeance. And I made my debut and I went, stop when I come through. Fuck you. Who and I'll fuck want what squad up one two. And like, I just, from that moment, I just threw down on this great Peter Project beat. Shout out to the great Peter Project, aka Coins. He's an amazing, amazing producer and an amazing person who's won and been nominated for multiple Canadian Screen Awards, and I'm still working with him now. Uh, Peter Project is one of the great songs. Also, still working with more or less. You know, really special people. And also, you were gonna, you you said that you really appreciate the high production value of the projects I've been able to put together, and that's not that's not credit that I've earned at all. The credit for the high production value of my music goes to. Uh, first, Measuring Man, who who was my original engineer, but then also uh, Fresh Kills, Meyer Clarity, Notion, and all three of them have banded together to make amazing beats for me, and also to engineer my material. And Measuring Man did a lot of it in the beginning as well. And all four of them are just extraordinary engineers and extraordinary producers of, of great beats and. Between them, they've put together astounding and brilliant music on my behalf. It's almost never been me involved with uh, the actual sound of the music. Very seldom, at least. Um, and, of course, I've had other producers help me out over the years. Red Dot from France, Skywise from Vermont, uh, my old homie Emperor Bohe, who used to work with me when back when I worked at a movie theater in 2008, 2009. Uh, I got a beat from him once daryl kellaway from newfoundland has worked with steps necessary in abstract art form and big boy tracks and a lot of these really special and amazing producers pen points ak productions a lot of people i've managed to work with over the years scythe of course scythe is a beast he's from uh i don't know which town in saskatchewan but his beats are incredible and skiza and i rap over a joint of his that we called extra credit on the most recent album that I've released, which is the duo album with Skizzle called Northern Playlistic Metropass Music. And that's a banger of a single, man. Like, that shit's crazy. Like, th all through my career, I've had the support and guidance and uh, been blessed with the creative energies of these tremendously talented uh, soundsmiths. And they've crafted incredible beats for me to rock over. Fresh Kills did the We Gon' Stomp Shit beat, which is a banger. You know, My Clarity keeps doing amazing shit for me. And, uh, Notions done some incredible shit for me, including the beat for Filmatic from my most recent uh, solo album, which is a banger of a beat. I asked him to sample uh, a song by the great Senegalese singer Yusu Endure, and he did, and it worked out beautifully. It was like, ah, just yeah, banging. And then for the joint that I did with Young Bleed, Notions sampled the meters, and it was just, ah, uh, like, you know, like it was just banging. Like, I'm making banging music, and I'm very proud and honored that I get to do that. You know what I'm talking about? Shout out to Harrison Hansroff, man. I don't know whether that's what you want me to call you now, but like, I just want to express my goodwill and appreciation that you're having me on and that you fuck with my music and you want to hear me talk about it. That's real ill. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, thanks so much. I'm happy to have you. Like, it's really Thanks, cool man. We've known each other for more than 20 years. Yeah, going back to high school, I remember you in the hallway telling people about your music and at that time, people didn't take you serious because maybe like you said, white rapper and stereotypes and such but i could feel like you had this fervence this energy about you that just came alive with confidence and that there was a spark there and i thought that i appreciate that very cool. much my friend yeah it's really cool to see and just as a rap fan like i find it so inspiring and and cool to see 
someone with that ability to like you're saying rap karaoke and stuff i've tried my hand at singing karaoke songs with rap music that i enjoy i've done like eminem and, and stuff and i just get tripped up with the words it's it's not easy to do at all especially even keeping up with how fast they speak and having the right tonage and all that it's 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 cool for me to see because it's so hard when i try to do it and i enjoy i appreciate that very much man yeah man and um like one other thing you mentioned how uh you have disabilities i can relate having autism and recently diagnosed with adhd Um, right i too am autistic At least we have reason to believe so, according to the professionals. The only reason I don't say for sure is because there's only one professional who has ever weighed in on that, but and it was a few years ago, but we'll see. Okay. Yeah, so how do these uh, struggles play into your view of life and your experience? Well, I mean, everyone's given a a rough... uh, load to handle to one degree or another right give me just a second i'm just gonna plug my phone in because i've noticed it's nearing the point at which it needs to be plugged in i'm not interrupting our conversation i'm just plugging the phone in so that it can charge while we speak um so so i mean i think probably the thing that actually tripped me up the most is not so much any of my disabilities or medical conditions so much as just losing my mother very early because my mother passed at the age of 43 on the 11th of September, 1997. I was nine. She had, uh, she was missing a substance in her blood, her blood called gamma globulin and she needed to go for regular blood transfusions. And one of her blood transfusions left her with uh, hepatitis C, which gave her cancer of the liver. And she was gone within a few years. Uh, she's still very dear to me and because of what I believe about the afterlife I believe actually she's thriving now and and very happy but it was still particularly painful for me to lose her because she and I were very close and she was also close with my sister and with my brother despite my brother having an entirely different mother and so all three of us were sort of scarred by her loss our father worked really hard to help us and to raise us in her absence but he had some limitations as a parent and it was difficult to relate to him in many ways and still is. And, uh, he's, he'll be 75 this year. And, uh, and I'll, I just turned 36 back in March. And, uh, and so I miss her terribly. And a lot of my songs have been about her and about her influence on me because a lot of the joy and joie de vivre and, and merriment and happiness and affection and, most of the most of the qualities in me that are good and that other people enjoy come from her to at least some degree. Mm. A lot of it's native to me because I've always chosen in the direction of love and kindness and affection and tenderness and warmth and joy and light and shit like that. But also a lot of it came to me directly from my mother, whose name was Viva, V-I-V-A-H. And she was the light of a lot of people's lives. And... Uh, a great many people all around the world still miss her very badly because she was so wonderful and luminous and radiant and extraordinary and glorious and amazing that she meant a lot in people's lives. And uh, certainly it was very difficult for me growing up without her. And it still is. Uh, that's why one of my songs on the most recent solo album to really the sorrow in heart is called, I still miss you every day. And I, I mean, as a matter of fact, I do. It's very difficult. And then of course, Like getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder sometime between the ages of 15 and 17. Like mania was originally really fun for me, as I imagine it is for a lot of people, because you saw surreal things and you had visions that felt like visions from God. And and uh, I used to see when I was manic, I've, I've seen friends of mine as in visions as angels and stuff like this. And that's very entertaining as long as you don't take it so seriously that you assume that. God may actually be speaking to you or that you're being commanded to do anything dangerous. But, uh, so I have cerebral palsy, a learning disability that affects executive functioning and task completion. That's two. Asthma is three. Autism is four. Obsessive compulsive disorder is five. 
Um, uh, sleep apnea is six, bipolar disorder is seven, and there's one more thing. What's the what's the uh, what's the what's the eighth thing? There's eight things: cerebral palsy number one, bipolar disorder number two, executive functioning disorder three, asthma four, sleep apnea five, OCD six, autism seven, and the reason it's going to bother me that I haven't can't remember number eight is because number eight is one of the ones that has the most obvious grounding in uh, in medical uh, my medical history. Like it's not just speculation. I know for sure that I have this next one, and I don't remember which one it is. Uh, but I'll get to it later, I guess. And then, of course, I would I had the good fortune. Knock on wood. I'm going to knock on some wood. I had the good fortune to to survive a pulmonary embolism that nearly killed me. In 2016, in the middle of the summer, my one of my lungs collapsed, and and I spent about 12 days in the intensive care unit. And you know, I was in nowhere land and nearly died. And you know, fuck it, I'm still here. Uh, there's something else in particular I can't quite remember what it is. Um, but in any case, uh, this is sort of my eccentricity collection, so to speak, the way I've been putting it. And uh, I have. A lot to be grateful for as a result of the fact that I've been able to persevere through it all, you know? Um, It it ain't always easy, and sometimes it's painful. In fact, just the other night, to be honest with you, I was uh, up late contemplating various of my failures and and struggles and was considering poisoning myself and overdosing on my medication just because I wanted to punish myself for the way I was feeling about things, which I was just miserable and I was uh, struggling to get my act together and and wasn't functioning terribly well um so these things they're sort of uh part of how the cookie crumbles i guess everyone's got their something everyone's got their struggles and whatnot and these are mine these are part of mine at least and so i swear there's an eighth thing that i'm forgetting that i'm i'm somehow failing to recall cerebral palsy bipolar disorder Asthma, sleep apnea, OCD, autism, the learning disability affecting executive functioning, and there's one more thing. What the hell is the one more thing? I've said those seven things a bunch of times. There's one more thing. Why can't I remember what the one more thing is? Ah, fuck it. Forgetfulness. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> Not in this particular case is it that that's not what I was looking for, but it could well be true considering everything, all the other information we have. Yeah, well, that's a very personal and profound explanation of who you are and what you struggle with. And I thank you for sharing and being so open. I think that's a lot what this podcast is about, trying to get to know people on a deeper level and how they experience the world and yeah i appreciate that very much and of course i've been obese for most of my life and so that hasn't been easy either although it's its own that's its own beast naturally but uh i've been lucky i've got wonderful friends all over the world and lots of music that means the world to me not just to make but also just to listen to and i care a lot about art films and i'm able to watch those on occasion and there's lots of light in the world lots of you know, teas and chocolate and dogs and flowers and beautiful creatures and just various uh, various and sundry reasons to be happy and to be grateful to be alive. And I'm also I've also, I've also been involved with the Baha'i faith for 21 years of my life, and I'm not exactly a perfect Baha'i, as the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Toronto will tell you, but. Uh, I've been striving to be a Baha'i more or less for 21 years and that means a lot to me too and it's an integral to my spiritual journey and to uh, my happiness. Yeah, that's a wonderful perspective the way you see the good in the world and that's I think what contributes to you living a fulfilling life and being able to collaborate with so many artists that have great talents and doing what you love is being able to focus on the good and for me, that's what I've been 
doing more recently and noticing how it affects life, having also had struggles, but it's about perspective. And I think you have the right perspective in terms of focusing on what positives are in the world and can come about despite struggles and challenges and things that might not be so great. But you're there, you're doing what you love, and that's what life is about, connecting with people on a meaningful level and having the joy of, of living in what's meaningful to you. Thanks very much. Yeah, I agree with you on uh, in, in a big way, and I appreciate that very much. I appreciate your faith in me and your belief that the way I'm living is ultimately honorable, because that's probably my main goal beyond anything else, is that even if I were obliged to stop making music or even if my connection to the Baha'i faith were severed or, you know, my problems suddenly got worse in terms of my mental health, etc. My main goal is to live honorably according to whatever definition I'm able to come up with. Uh, just I want to be good and kind and loving and sweet and tender and affectionate and be kind to just good to people. I like being good to people. And I'm blessed to know, you know, I have more than I have. One thing that my brother has said to me, my brother is one of my biggest supporters. And he said to me, like, Noah has five or six friends or even 10 friends for every one friend you or I have. My brother said to someone once, and uh, I'm lucky because I've got wonderful friends all over the world. And it's uh, very meaningful. And and uh, I do my best to shower their lives with love and affection and warmth and tenderness and you know the great majority of them reciprocate and those who don't it work, works itself out peacefully but uh those who do it, we've been able to enjoy very meaningful and rich and tender and and delightful friendships for in some cases upwards of 25 years you know it's been it's really been a wonderful thing and it's a gift that i've been given to be able to relate to people on an authentic an honest level in a way that makes them feel loved and valued for the most part which isn't to say that i never fuck up by the grace of god you know heaven heavens no but uh generally speaking i'm able to relate to people in ways that make them feel seen and cared about and valued and i've been good at that for a very long time and i i strive to cultivate those qualities because i want constantly to be increasing the happiness of the people who mean the most to me of whom there are very many such people so, and I could, I'm not going to give you any names, but it's just because giving you a procession of names wouldn't make very much sense in the context of this podcast. But God knows that there are easily more than 50 people I could name who mean the world to me. So uh, I've been very lucky. And, you know, and of them, maybe 20 of the 50 live in Toronto, where I do. And then uh, another 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or more than that live all over the world. I have friends in you know, not quite every country you could name, but many of the countries you could name, certainly. Belgium and Slovakia and Holland and Israel and Finland and Palestine and Senegal and Mauritius and Guyana. Lots of wonderful, wonderful, precious people. And of, from practically every imaginable ethnic background, religious tradition, uh straight people and gay people and bisexual people and people who are non-binary and cisgender people and transgender people and just almost every imagine people of varying ages and socio socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, ethnicities, heritages, you know, it's just been the most wonderful thing. And I love that aspect of human diversity. I love the, uh, I love the reality of human diversity. I love the fact that there's a ceaselessly interesting and meaningful, you know, uh, there, I should say, there's a ceaselessly interesting procession of people to meet and interact with in meaningful ways. And uh, there's so many limitlessly interesting topics that deserve to be explored. Religion and philosophy and spirituality and politics and music and movies and books and this and that and that and this. And like the human mind and human heart can go virtually limitless places and do so many interesting things and i find that endlessly fascinating and actually what i will say is that i feel somewhat liberated by my disabilities and the ability to, uh, and the fact that i'm able to receive government disability support i feel liberated from some of the strictures and depredations of capitalism which i mostly hate despite being a, a liberal rather than a, rather than a leftist you know um I'm very glad that I'm not obliged to participate in capitalism to the degree that it, that it would wear my 
you know, ability to create joy in the world and try to facilitate joy for others down, which I feel like there are very many people whose creative and, and uh, creative capacities and capacities for wellness and capacities to create happiness for themselves and others would be unleashed if capitalism were a little bit less brutal. So I feel grateful that I'm not obliged to work a job that would grind away at my capacity to inspire joy in others because uh, it gives me the capacity to make a positive contribution to the lives of others on a regular basis and in a meaningful way. And I'm tremendously grateful for that every day. I, I consider myself very humbled and very honored to have that capacity and opportunity. Well, that's lovely. Like I can relate as well, having recently gotten support from the government, and I feel the same Are about. You... Harrison. Pardon. Are you on Ontario Disability Support too, Harrison? Uh, no, the Ontario Works. It's a temporary version. Right. And yes. I've been also felt very privileged and blessed to have that support, and I feel too how being forced to do something you don't believe in for work to survive can really eat at your soul. And I want to show the world that I care and I'm trying to do things like uh, I spoke to someone in charge of the passenger care at the airport in terms of trying to facilitate uh, um, new things for people with autism like myself who have sensory issues and to implement new uh, structural designs and solutions to cater to people who have certain disabilities or sensitivities. And sure. I feel good about those kinds of pursuits that I'm lucky to be able to do. And so, yeah, I very much, uh, like I like how you're saying you like to do things for the world and relate to people. And that's what I think life is about connecting with people and helping each other and without getting bogged down into this kind of capitalism, which is not really helpful to society more. So if we all collaborated as one and didn't focus on who has more and who has to do what we can achieve a lot of goodness. And I think that's yeah. I th right. I think I, I'm not enough of a theoretician to have any intelligent responses to capitalism, especially because I'm very skeptical of Marxism and very skeptical of communism, because I think every time communism's ever been tried over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries, it's been terrible. So I'm, I, I'm very much not a leftist because I don't endorse most of the responses to capitalism that have ever, ever been developed. I think they're mostly terrible. And the, the 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 list of communist leaders is like a horror show of, you know, Stalin and Lenin and Mao and Ho and Pol Pot and Ho Chi Minh and Castro and Chavez and all these assholes. I don't like those people, and I don't want to think that because I'm opposed to capitalism that I have to endorse those ideas. Um, and in fact, because uh, one finds social democrats and uh, the like almost everywhere. I'd like to think there are uh, intelligent uh, critics of capitalism who don't give into the totalitarian temptation represented by communism. But, uh, but I do ultimately still believe that what you're saying has merit. And I think it would resonate with a large number of people if we were able to try to develop our societies and economies in ways that didn't require such a like a mechanistic separation between the things that satisfy the souls of human beings and the things that human beings need to do to put bread on the table. I do actually think something is reconcilable there. I don't know for sure what or how, but I do think it's possible to make advancements that uh, are not generally made or haven't been made so far, and that it's possible to do them without uh the, the sort of giving into the sham the lie of of that communism is going to make things better because i think it's proven over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries that the opposite is true it makes it worse and actually i would rather put up with a society with a certain amount of capitalism in it rather than give into the temptation of lenin and stalin and mao and all the rest of them but mm -hmm. by the same token i think 
there are lots of intelligent and thoughtful critics out there and and writers and thinkers and whatever who have meaningful things to say about how to solve social and political and economic problems who are at neither extreme. So uh, for me, one of the nice things about not having a job, so to speak, is that I have time to explore these ideas. And there's some people I read who are on the political right and some people I read who are on the political left and some people I read who are on the political center. I'm more or less in the political center myself, notwithstanding certain Baha'i ideas that I try to promote. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think that uh, there are, honestly, despite the polarization and despite these sort of terrible invective that right and left like to hurl at each other and the the sort of snark and laziness and affected um sort of ersatz boredom that sort of swallows everyone up nowadays in the contemporary discourse it's still the case that there are intelligent people on every side of the spectrum uh or, or every point on the spectrum that is who have thoughtful things to say and who make positive contributions to the discourse even if many of those people if you put them face to face with one another they would hate one another because they have things to say on other issues that would totally alienate each other that's just sort of the way things are i think that uh i try not to close my ears to very many voices and i think there are very many voices where you know you could take the 10 most intelligent thinkers on the right and the 10 most intelligent thinkers on the left and half of the issues that they disagree on they'd be trying to tear out each other's throats over but then the other half would be things where they could come to an accord and a compromise and and i feel blessed that i'm even that i even have time and energy to look into all this because and the reason i have time and energy to look into all of it is that i don't have a job so this i guess is 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 another aspect of the um of the way disability has played itself out in my life that I, um, that I uh, have permission from the state to spend my time in these ways. If I see fit, although ultimately, obviously they prefer that I show up to the capitalist cookie factory. It hasn't penalized me for not doing so. And as long as I can live within my means, which is admittedly sometimes difficult, um, you know, this is the way things are. And so uh, I'm grateful to have what I have. Yeah. Beautifully said. It's meeting life on life's terms. And everyone yeah. has different struggles. And we're doing the best we can. And it's beautiful to see that you're making a life for yourself as an artist and collaborating with people and making friends and connecting with people that you love. And I think that's what life is all about. And Yeah, so I think that's what we'll leave for the world to to learn from this is the beauty of life is just being having the ability to connect with different people and see them as humans and learn from each of them. Oh yeah. That's the beauty of life, man. I mean, that's a topic we could get into at some length because I find life ceaselessly beautiful and ceaselessly wonderful and meaningful and glorious and amazing, even though there's all kinds of sin in the world, all kinds of sadness, all kinds of people doing work in cruelty who don't know how to use their souls properly, so they waste their souls, you know, but the the beauty of life is, is such that, I mean, it's just, the beauty of life is just the sum total of the beauty of every human soul, and the great majority of human souls are beautiful because the great majority of human beings at least on some level, are striving to live honorable lives. And human beings, by virtue of being human beings, deserve to be loved, deserve to be cared about, deserve to be cherished, deserve to have a certain standard of living and rights and and the like. And I realize this is getting into utopian speak a little bit, but uh, ultimately I do believe that human life is precious as such. Human beings are valuable as such. And uh, the human soul and the human mind and the human heart are sort of realms of limitless possibility and glory and magic and light and wonder. And uh, 
it's just a matter of harnessing those capacities and learning to live honorably and use your soul in a way that makes sense and and to love and to be kind and that sort of thing i really uh, it, it may seem a little bit uh pat like a little bit wan like a, a wan one like maybe a little bit like uh, yeah, it's, uh, using a lot of words to say nothing but i really do believe that human beings are valuable in ourselves and that the capacities of the human mind and heart and soul to develop virtue and to be good and honorable are limitless. So that's what I, that's the way I see it. And I appreciate that you care, man. I appreciate that you see it roughly the same way. And I appreciate that you care. So shout out to my man, Harrison, you know, all that. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, if you could leave the viewers with something to get to know you or where they can find more about you. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, my given name is Noah Goodbaum, N-O-A-H-G-O-D-B-A-U-M. I don't really have any compunction about letting people add me on Facebook if they see fit. Uh, you can reach out to me there. Uh, there's also, if you go to themightyrhino.bandcamp.com, you will find most, not all, but most of my most recent projects. They should be there. Uh, T-H-E-M-I-G-H-T-Y-R-H-I-N-O.bandcamp.com uh, To Relieve the Sorrow Laden Hearts there, which is my most recent solo album. And so is Northern Flavalistic Metro Pass Music, which is my uh, duo album with Skizza. And uh, if you, if you, facebook.com slash the mighty rhino, I'm on the website that used to be called Twitter as at, uh, at J-O-H-N-K-H-A-N-T-H-E-D-O-N, John Con the Don, which is one of my nicknames. I'm there, and you're welcome to follow me there. I post updates on politics and stuff. And uh, I swear there was one more thing. Oh, yes. Um, on Spotify, my music, almost all my music is available on Spotify, with the exception of my first album, and I'm working on that. Um, uh, if you go, if you type in the words T-H-E, second word, M-I-G-H-T-Y, third word, R-H-I-N-O, that's the Mighty Rhino, and that's where you find my music, and there's lots of great stuff there. So feel free to reach out. I'm delighted to meet you. If you let me know that you discovered me on the podcast, we can chop it up, and it's all good, man. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, bro, I look forward to meeting people, you know what I'm saying? Oh, and I should add... uh, I think if you go if you type in the Mighty Rhino on TikTok, I'm also there as well. I mostly just post updates every couple of days, telling people how I'm feeling and etc. But uh, that's another place you can find me. So it's all love, y'all, and I appreciate y'all caring about me. And that's an honor. And it's all love, baby, baby. Yeah, round of scoot. All love. You said it. Thank you so much for being on there. Thanks, Pimpin. And Pimpin. and I'll, hopefully we'll catch up soon. Sounds good, man. I'd be happy to come back. Let me know what you need. Awesome, man. Have a good Bless day. up. Good night, homie. Be well. Much love.